All right, so welcome to my presentation. I'm Daniel Klesa. I'm the founder and primary developer of the Chimera Linux project, which is a Linux distribution. It's a general purpose Linux distribution with a particular focus on uh, desktop computers as well as uh, different uh, similar cases, I mean client computer kind of cases like single board computers and so on. But since it's uh, general purpose, we are also implementing server purposes and other things, basically like just about any Linux distribution. Uh, its uh, focus is uh, to be robust, uh, as well as to have a stronger security hardening than most uh, standard Linux distributions, as well as having a good default for things, uh, being deterministic, so that you can actually install things uh, using a single process, and then it will come out pretty much the same every time, and it will pretty much work out of the box. It's also supposed to be lightweight and transparent, as well as overall pragmatic, so not really focused on one particular thing like, uh, like many niche projects tend to do. Uh, it uses LLVM as its system toolchain. It uh, currently only has LLVM. Well, we do have uh, some uh, GCC builds, uh, which are bare metal builds for building new boot for different single board computers. But as, as a general purpose GCC compiler, we do not have any right now. I've actually started some work to introduce uh, GCC as an option, but so far I've run into this uh, very annoying bootstrap back on uh, PowerPC, which prevents me from uh, fully introducing it so far. So it uses uh, tools from uh, FreeBSD as its core user land, which are hardened with uh, the rest of the core system. And it uses uh, Muscle as its ellipse of choice. I'll expl explain why at a later point. Uh, for Package Manager, it uses APK tools, which is known from Alpine Linux. But it uses the next generation of APK tools, uh, which is uh, currently under development and not deployed in an any other system. It uses binary packaging, obviously, but it also has uh, an option to compile things from source if you like to. It has a from scratch made uh, uh, fresh uh, build system which creates APK repositories. Uh, there's also a sort of uh, intention to have things be bootstrappable, uh, so you can compile the system from scratch from source and bring it up uh, to the same state as it is in already. Uh, using some other Linux uh, system as uh, you know, a base. It can cross-compile. Uh, we do not do cross-compiling for any official repositories. All the, native, all the packages we actually ship, 45 architectures we ship, they are native. But uh, there's the option to cross-compile in the build system sort of transparently, so it does a lot of things for you. So you don't have to, Generally, the packaging template doesn't have to do much to be able to cross-compile. As long as the build system for the project itself doesn't have some weird cross-compiling issues, it will sort of work by default. We do support many architectures, including uh, Arch64, uh, little and big Indian 64-bit uh, PowerPC, uh, RISC-V, also in 64-bit version only right now, and obviously also x86-64. It includes uh, system-wide uh, link time optimization for pretty much all packages. I think right now we have about uh, 1,500 packaging templates and only about 50 or so have LTO disabled. And some of these are basically false positives, like the kernel has a different way to enable LTO than standard. Some are things uh, like scripted things and so on. We also enable a subset of uh, UBSAN in production builds set up in a trapping mode so that it does not actually include any runtime in the resulting binaries. This is mainly used to mitigate uh, signed integer overflows, which should become uh, uh, hard crashes uh, in pretty much all packages, unless ex with some exceptions where things are currently broken in a way uh, which cannot be immediately fixed. Uh, we at least use this to keep track of everything which has these kind of issues and fix them later. We also try to deploy CFI, or con Control Flow Integrity Mitigation from Clank uh, system-wide, which is a lot harder task because uh, a huge number of software breaks with that. Uh, this is mainly C software, where the issue is that many C programmers tend to like uh, uh, having like a function pointer, which has some signature. 
and then they take some function and cast uh, this function pointer to the original signature. And CFI does not like that. In C, this is undefined behavior, and people tend to think that it's actually okay because, uh, for example, your custom function, which you are taking a pointer to, is taking pointer arguments, and the original thing is taking void pointer arguments. And it, they think it's okay because uh, it will get implicitly casted to void, but this is uh, like, it's still undefined behavior. You shouldn't do that. You should uh, declare your function with the original signature, the one you want to have, and then cast these things within the implementation properly, and then you will have no undefined behavior. But people tend to avoid this because they are lazy or whatever. <laughs> in any case, uh, to get started, how I got started. It was in uh, early 2021. And it was, uh, uh, I decided to create a build system for Linux distributions called CBuild, which was originally a re-implementation re of the XBPSSRC system from Void Linux, which I was using at the time. Uh, it's uh, written from scratch and it's uh, implemented in Python because uh, I've sort of gotten tired of uh, uh, different uh, distro build systems being written as uh, massive bash scripts which uh, both results in the system being slow and also the system being difficult to debug and track issues in and also it's hard to trust these kind of systems so when it comes to uh, actually being integrated so you usually want to delegate things like signing and so on to different places because it's sort of impossible to tell which uh, things can interact with uh, which other things and which uh, things run in trusted context and which don't and so on. So I sort of wanted to avoid uh, all this kind of nonsense and create a system from scratch which does not have these kind of issues. Uh, so my initial Initial system was uh, Void Linux, as I said at the time, on PPC 64 LE architecture. Uh, CBuild uh, has a sandbox, which means uh, the environment in which everything is built uh, is uh, sort of a container implemented with Linux namespaces. Uh, we try to harden this container as much as possible to restrict what uh, build systems and so on can do, but at the same time allow common software to be built reasonably. So, like. There's no network access in the container after some point. Uh, the root file system of the container is uh, read-only, and it will, can, it will only write to directories where it's supposed to write, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, so the sandbox also means that uh, it can be run on any distribution, even if the distribution is actually completely incompatible with ours. Uh, so it's isolated. So what does the bootstrap process for the system look like and what it looked like uh, back in 2021? Uh, there's four stages basically. Stage zero is uh, to bring up the first version of the bootstrap uh, or the build container, which runs uh, using the tool chain from the outside system. And uh, you basically use the outside tool chain to compile all the basic things you need uh, to assemble the minimal build environment. This is done with uh, sort of uh, minimal features and also not many compiler flags and so on. So things like LTO are disabled at this point. Uh, we cannot make too many assumptions about what kind of compilers used on the outside. So we try not to and just assemble sort of uh, an environment to which uh, is good enough that it can be used to build more things. For stage one, we use these generated packages from stage zero built to actually assemble the container and build uh, the same thing again, uh, but using the new packages. We repeat this twice more. For stage two, we enable LTO and basically all the flags we need, uh, uh, which will match the final environment. So the result of that is basically uh, what you want, uh, basically equivalent to the final. But just for a good measure, we use these uh, good final or, or almost final binaries to rebuild once more and get a clean, uh, clean environment, which can be used to build uh, everything afterwards. So what does the environment look like? Uh, it's a sort of a bare minimum set of packages to build itself. Uh, so the container is small enough so it can build itself, but also like uh, uh, you can install more dependencies into it depending on what you are building and so on. Uh, have some build graph and build it over time and so on. So there's Ellipse obviously and there's the compiler which is in our case uh, Clank and the rest of the LVM suite. 
There's the core user land, like uh, different utilities, uh, basically that makes up uh, basic Linux system, uh, because build systems need to run these and so on. And there's the package manager, which is used to manipulate uh, packages installed within the build container to uh, for different purposes. It's uh, a small Chimera Linux system, just containerized. Uh, the containerization is done using the bubble wrap tool, which is also used, for example, by Flatpak. And it provides a minimal interface to the Linux namespace uh, uh, kernel feature, which uh, lets us uh, make these small sandbox containers without requiring much other infrastructure. The outside host system needs to provide only Python for running CBuild itself bubble wrap and uh, a potentially static build of APK. And that's basically all it needs to provide. Everything else is sort of set up by us. It runs completely unprivileged. There's nothing which needs root, and you cannot run it as root. So why use LVM? It's a more modern compiler design in uh, GCC, and it has many implications. It has uh, state-of-the-art sanitizers, uh, which are in a better shape than in GCC. GCC does have some of these sanitizers, but uh, it tends to be more out of date, and things like CFI are, for example, not present in GCC at all. It's also much easier to build and bootstrap. Uh, with It has a relatively standard build system compared to GCC, which is sort of uh, completely custom, half auto tools, half uh, some other cursed thing, you know. Uh, also, cross-building with uh, LVM is much easier because you only have uh, one compiler and you only need uh, the specific uh, runtimes for the different sysroots for different targets. Uh, it also has thin LTO, which actually enables us to deploy LTO system-wide uh, and not fear it will actually be much of a problem. It uses far less resources this way. It's much faster. It's uh, Slower than uh, non-LTO build, obviously, but it's still uh, the overhead is not so big that we cannot do it. Uh, it also has uh, actually better performance these days, which n didn't always used to be a thing, but nowadays uh, it tends to be that Clang tends to compile, tends to perform about five percent faster on average in resulting binaries than GCC does, and often it uh, tends to be less buggy in my experience. As for why not use LLVM, very occasionally there's worse compatibility with things. Uh, some things will not compile well with LLVM, uh, especially like things with very cursed linker scripts and so on sometimes run into trouble with LLD. Uh, some of the supported architectures are kind of less maintained than uh, in GCC, which supports an impressive amount of architectures. And overall, there's fewer architectures supported. The LLVM suite as a whole also takes uh, much longer to build because it's in C++ and it's a sort of idiomatic C++. So on most architectures, this is not an issue. But for example, on our RISC-V builder, which is, uh, which is not real hardware, actually. It, we built in uh, QMU user emulation because it's uh, like seven times faster than uh, the best next real hardware. Uh, it's still very slow, and it takes like maybe uh, 10 to 15 hours to actually build a new version of the tool chain, so it's it's not great. And very rarely there's uh, worse performance in like runtime performance in some things. So like I think in maybe in some OpenMP things, uh, the state of that is still a little bit worse and so on. But it's not a big deal. Now let's take a look at the tool chain structure of a typical Linux distribution. You have your C library, which is uh, usually these days almost always glibc or muscle. Other ellipses do exist, but they are very rarely used. Pretty much nobody uses things like UC ellipse and so on these days. You have GNU binutils, which provides uh, things like assembler and the linker and manipulation tools for ELF files and so on. And then you have GCC itself, which is a C and C++ compiler plus a compiler front end for many different languages, plus a core runtime, or well, a portion of core runtime, because uh, some of the core runtime is provided by LibC, some is provided by GCC. You have libgcc also and libgccs for the unwinder and so on. You have the C++ standard library called libstdc++ and uh, that kind of stuff. You tend to have uh, one build of uh, binutils and GCC per target. 
Uh, the user on the ABI, it tends to look like you have the built-ins uh, for fallbacks, which are in libgcc.a, statically linked, plus the CRT, and you have the unwinder plus dynamic built-ins in libgccs, and the C++ standard library, and so on. And it, with LLVM, it looks a little bit different. You have the compiler, linker, assembler, bin utils, and everything all in one, all in one suite. You just compile it all. The only separate component is the libc, which tends to be, again, glibc or muscle, with glibc being sort of problematic still. So mm, that's the main reason we went with muscle. Uh, you have one compiler for all your targets, and then you only compile the runtimes for the others. Uh, the ABI also looks a little bit different, but this is not used in most distros because uh, in most distros, LLVM acts as a drop-in compiler for, you know, GCC. Uh, but with native LLVM style ABI, you have the built-ins, which uh, provide uh, all the libgcc.a plus uh, a portion of libgccs, which is also statically linked in this case. And libunwind.so.1 only provides the unwinder ABI part of uh, libgccs. So uh, you also have the C++ library, which is different, but uh, it can live in one process with libstd C++ because uh, libc++ uses uh, anonymous namespaces in a clever way, and that l allows this, these symbols to mangle differently, so it can actually live in one process. As for ABI compatibility, as I said, libunwind implements most of libgccs. So to make a makeshift libgccs, you basically have to uh, cre create a shared library of uh, libclang uh, built-ins, uh, and then uh, link it to libunwind. And this will implicitly pull in all these symbols. And at least in a muscle environment, which has no version symbols, this will work. On a glibc environment, it might not. Uh, as I said, libc++ might be able to live in one process, but this actually is only in theory, because you might have to make libstd c++ use libc++ ABI as a base. Uh, it will still conflict otherwise. Uh, glibc could not build with Clang until recently, now it does, but it's still uh, incompatible with native LLVM style ABI because it uh, dynamically opens libgccs, and therefore we cannot use it. Muscle just works and always worked, uh, so that's okay. There's another very neat thing in LLVM, that's the allocator called Scudo. It's the default allocator on uh, uh, Android, uh, and it's a hardened allocator, but still a very high performance allocator. It has a modular, modular design, which is uh, very different from most allocators, so it makes very few assumptions about the environment you can run it in. So you can sort of uh, mix and match uh, these components and configure them differ differently. So uh, most uh, allocators tend to assume that you have ELF TLS available at this point, and they can just use fairly local variables. You cannot do this with muscle in libc.so, because uh, uh, the dynamic linker doesn't set, it, set things up until later, and the dynamic linker and the libc are the same file, so you, you have to be a little bit clever about it. We replaced uh, the standard allocator with uh, Scudo in uh, in. Uh, in our system because it's much faster. For example, LTO linking of with LD takes a third of the time now. So that's uh, quite a big difference. The main reason for this is because uh, Muscle's stock allocator uses a global lock for uh, consistency, but this uh, sort of pegs it to one thread, so it's uh, not very, it's not great. Uh, we have no LFTLS, so we sort of uh, just uh, put a pointer in directly in the PFRS structure and ha implement a custom thingy around it, and that works. And the main drawback is very high, high uh, virtual memory usage. Uh, with uh, the standard primary allocator, is about eight gigabytes per process, which is kind of insane. But uh, with uh, the primary 30, 32 allocator we use, uh, it's only about 120 megs, which is still a lot, uh, much more than most allocators. But uh, I have plans to try to tune it further. Uh, cross compilation, uh, well, CBuild can uh, cross compile. Uh, Cross targets need uh, cross runtimes, which we do compile, but it has a little bit tricky bootstrap uh, if you need to do it without pre-existing syswords. So the cross compiling environment needs to include uh, compiler RT, uh, muscle, uh, libunwind, and libc++ and its ABI library. This is all installed into one directory, which is treated as uh, the system root for the cross uh, target, and that's how you use it. It's pretty much standard. 
So to bootstrap this kind of thing, you first uh, built compiler RT, uh, or well, a small part of compiler RT, the built-ins, plus CRT begin and end files. Uh, you do this by telling CMake to force static libs only, uh, to get rid of uh, compiler executable checks, which will not work at this point because it doesn't have the complete toolchain available. And you disable all the sanitizers, so you can compile them later. At this early point, you only have to compile these built-ins and the CRT base. Uh, it requires libc headers for that still, so you just give it some libc headers, you just take muscle and tell it to install libc headers in a, the temporary directory and then give it to, to that, and that works. And then, once you have this, you can actually build and install Ellipse itself. Uh, it needs only the above parts. <coughs> and once you are done with that, you can build and install Lipunwind plus uh, Libc++ together, which it's best to do it together because you can do it together. And if you do it together, you actually remove yourself some trouble of uh, having these things interact at build time. So you just tell it to build all three components and you're good to go. Uh, once uh, you still need explicit no std lib and uh, C CXS flags because you do not have the std lib available at this point and the build system will otherwise assume it and break. Now once you have this you can actually compile, or, compile the rest of uh, compiler RT. Uh, this is uh, mainly the sanitizers uh, as what you typically want. <coughs> And once you have all this in a sysroot, this is the full cross runtime you need, and you can happily cross compile anything for this target. As for practical experiences with LVM, uh, as I already mentioned before, it makes uh, system wide LTO actually possible. It has uh, far lower resource usage this way compared to uh, GCC LTO. Uh, for example, at work, uh, uh, well, I'm currently on a break, but I'm coming back to work soon. Uh, at work, I work on WebKit, and when I compile WebKit with uh, GCC LTO, it climbs, the memory usage climbs to 80 gigabytes of RAM, and it runs out of memory and crashes. So with uh, thin LTO and Clang, this does not happen. It, uh, the resource usage stays uh, firmly within uh, some 30% extra overhead uh, compared to a standard build, so that's very nice. And uh, of course, there's the security hardening side, which uh, I already mentioned. We deploy a subset of UBSAN, and CFI is uh, used to where we can use it. And other things uh, we mark it as to do and um, maybe fix things later. But the entire core user land is uh, hardened this way, for example. As for toolchain patching uh, in the distribution, this is mostly in line with GCC, but still more than I would really like. It's about 30 patches we maintain downstream. I would like to upstream some of them, but I need to clean them up first, so yeah. On Linux, uh, distributions tend to be geared towards uh, GCC style runtime, so LLVM is often reduced to being sort of a, you know, a drop-in compiler for GCC, which is a bit of a shame. I think more people should use the native runtimes and actually test these properly on Linux, so not just on uh, systems where they are native. Uh, and also the build system of uh, LLVM can unfortunately sometimes be a big unpenetrable mess. Uh, it's partially due to CMake itself being kind of terrible, but uh, it could still be a bit better. Also major releases of LLVM uh, can be kind of daunting to update to because they pretty much uh, universally and always break uh, some compilation of something. This is usually for good reasons. For instance, recently LVM actually switched uh, uh, some uh, invalid uh, function pointer cache uh, to be errors by default, as well as uh, disable uh, KNR style function declarations uh, without uh, return type and so on. <coughs> this would be fine, and this is actually a very good thing which should have happened 20 years ago. But it didn't, and now when, when this happened, uh, we actually still run into tons of uh, projects which break on this, and worse, it's actually, it actually breaks in ways which we do not like. Uh, particularly, for example, GNU Auto Tools. Uh, lots of projects with GNU Auto Tools tend to be generated with ancient versions of Auto Tools because they ship these pre-generated configure files. 
And these uh, use uh, KNR style functions for different checks. And when uh, this happens, uh, the compilation of the conf test will fail. And it will get treated as uh, not having some feature, which will happen implicitly, and then you will lose that feature. And this might sort of, uh, you know. So what we did uh, is basically switch to always regenerating AutoTools files uh, on any project where we can do it. Uh, just to never trust these uh, pre-generated configure files because it's really bad to trust them. Uh, this kind of stuff happens, and uh, as I said, it's usually for a good reason, and it's a really good thing that uh, LVM is actually pushing these things, which should have been done 20, 20, or, 20 or 30 years ago, but uh, yeah, it's still a little bit of a pain. On the other hand, the community of uh, LVM has been uh, very good and helpful in my experience, and especially shout-outs to Math Gray, who has been writing very, very uh, nice blog posts about all sorts of things, and also has been extremely helpful on IRC and in different places uh, with uh, actually figuring out different issues of the tool chain and so on. Well, in conclusion, it's uh, generally a really nice tool chain, and there are some pain, but in general it's uh, nice and practical. Uh, it can uh, build just about any Linux software, which is neat, uh, especially given how many extensions and so on GCC has. And it should not be reduced to just the drop-in thing for GCC use on Linux. Uh, it should be treated as a standalone thing more, I think. Thank you for listening, and if you have any questions, uh, now is the time to ask. Yeah. Uh, how do you schedule package builds on your builders? Because uh, if you remember thing LTL, it may at the same time it's all your CPU or something Yeah, basically what happens is that uh, you push uh, your thingy or change to the C ports GitHub repo, and then we have a build bot which will pick up these changes and then schedule them all into the different workers, which will build them and then upload them to the final repo server. So one worker is just building one package at a time? Uh, yeah, basically, yeah. It's good enough uh, for the time being. It's sort of, uh, it, it, it may receive a batch and the build system will sort of sort it and then uh, do the thing it needs to do. Uh, yeah? Do we have any idea about the, the size of the thing? The, the minimum build, how big is it? And, and what unit are you using? Uh, size of what? Uh, like the, of the system? Yeah. Uh, well, a minimal uh, container kind of system. Oh yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, so uh, he was asking uh, w about the size of the minimal system, and it depends on on the case really. Like a, a very minimal container kind of uh, built uh, is ab about seven megabytes, while a bo bo bootable system is maybe I don't know fifty or sixty if you really make it small. But then you pull in Linux firmware, and then it uh, grows to five hundred. So, yeah. There was one more question in there. Uh, the question was if uh, there's any significant performance drop to enable in these uh, sanitizers. No, there isn't, because most of UBSAN is very cheap uh, and incurs basically practically no runtime overhead in practice. Uh, as for CFI, it uh, depends on uh, the specific software, but in most cases, also not. Uh, as for other things, it really depends on the same size. But the stuff we need is uh, pretty much always uh, very lightweight. Yeah? All right, that's a question <coughs> in the matrix room, so coming from somewhere online, I'll just read out loud. I wonder how many, which packages happen to fail if you have no network access at all in the build container after the preparation step? Well, installing all build apps from a known mirror, <coughs> and especially before starting any upstream provided scripts. Pretty much anything written in uh, C or C++ tends to be okay and require no network access when you build it. Uh, what does require network access uh, is uh, pretty much anything written in Rust, Go, or uh, like uh, some JavaScript stuff, or uh, say some uh, big software like LibreOffice tends to download things from the in internet by default. So we do have workarounds for that. Like for Rust, uh, we have a step uh, which is run 
immediately after installing uh, other dependencies, which will pre-download and pre-vendor all these uh, dependencies uh, into the tree. And then from that point onwards, it will disable network access for the rest. Anything else? Oh, yeah, here. Uh, so the question was about uh, bitcode for static libraries. Uh, yes, we do ship static libraries in bitcode format. Uh, the main issue with that is they tend to be fairly big because you cannot strip the, the back info from them. But uh, we, what we do is split uh, static libraries into individual sub packages, so you don't install them by default unless it's needed. But you can still install these uh, static libraries when you want them. Anything else? Uh, yeah? How well is uh, the solution like for a daily driver? Is it well, I'm running it uh, on this laptop, for example. Uh, and I'm running it on my workstation and my other workstation, which are Arch64 and PPC64 LE systems. And then there's uh, other people who run uh, this and has uh, the main issue is really like uh, lack of some software at this point. But it's uh, still. Uh, much bigger than any niche distribution or has been uh, at this point. There's uh, 1,500 or 1,600 uh, templates, uh, which is one template for one uh, software. And we even include uh, some uh, really major big things like uh, LibreOffice or Chromium and Firefox and basically all this kind of stuff. Okay, thank you.